Ähm, wir haben jetzt noch mal sozusagen Primetime für Pia, die vorhin gesagt hat, lacht doch einfach den Rest des Tages Q&A mit Dave Snowden. Nicht nur Pia, da haben sehr viele zugestimmt. Yeah. Um, okay, let, so let's switch to English and see whether Dave can hear us. Hi Dave. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Awesome. Um, thanks for joining us again. And thanks for your uh, keynote. There has been a lot of uh, positive feedback, both on Twitter and also on, on our feedback system. I hope that uh, we'll send um, the feedback that came through the system to you um, soon so that you can also iterate cool. and um, uh, get a little better step by step. Um, so maybe like my questions may be shallow. Um, but um, if listening to you is as complex as your topic, complexity is complex. So, so I have to, me as a shallow person, uh, I have to um, concentrate to follow you and to understand that. I, I, I loved your talk. I've learned a lot. I've um, uh, a lot of questions about the content. But my question for you, or first question is, do you think that there is room for someone kind of who bridges the gap between a deep talk like yours and um, has like very simple messages? Or is the abstraction of, you probably know these talks where you only have like 50 point um, headlines, only three words, and You can you can only look at the slide uh, every two minutes and then you know oh this is what I what he wants to get across there's this one line and that's it um, so does this abstraction um, wreck the whole complexity thing do I have to go so deep or is there a I don't know another style where you could say okay here are the shallow messages for those who don't get what Dave Snowden says I think you question? have to look at Yeah, I do. And I think you have to look at the way ideas develop. So mm -hmm. I remember people saying that to me about systems thinking in the 1980s. And five years later, the language was commonplace. When mm -hmm. a new idea comes in, it takes time for people to break the old, old ways of thinking. Yeah? If you look at what I did in that presentation, I gave you some base scientific level facts and some fairly simple methods. That is actually a lot less abstract than most conversations in Agile around Scrum or XP. It's just I, you're I not familiar yeah. with it. Yeah, the point is you're not familiar with it. And you've got to be careful and compromise here. There's a Mullen Nasruddin story. I don't know whether you know the stories of the Mullen Nasruddin, but it's a Sufi tradition. In Sufi philosophy, you can only tell stories. You're not allowed to logic, argue logically. And there's a famous story about the Mullah Nasruddin who'd lived in a city and he'd never seen a hawk before, a raptor. And he'd only ever seen pigeons. Mm -hmm. And one day a hawk landed on his windowsill and he looked at it and he said, you poor bird. And he clipped its beaks, he clipped its wings, so it looked like a pigeon. And then he said, now you're a proper bird. And what you just asked me to do was to convert a hawk into a pigeon and it's a bad idea. Yeah, okay. I, I was expecting this. <laughs> um, I, um, le let me try to rephrase that. Like you said, for example, patterns in a complex world are open-ended. And um, this is kind of a frightening thought because a lot of people, they want to have control over their life. They, they want change to be in a, in a limitful way. Um, do you think that it's good? To, to give them this impression that they, they don't have to be frightened? Or is it just like uh, you have to face it, that complexity is open-ended, that uh, you can't see the pattern, um, and accepting that is liberating? I wouldn't express it like that. I mean, everybody in that audience lives complexity in a day-to-day -day life in the way they manage their families and manage their friendships. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you would, I mean, it's why the children's party story, which is the best teaching story I created, is so popular, because everybody can resonate with it. On a day-to-day -day basis, we assume that our relationships are open, ambiguous, they can develop in many different ways. So why we think we abandon that when we go into a company, I don't know. And I think the reason is we've had about 20 or 30 years of people taking an engineering approach and not an ecological approach. And basically engineers want things in nice structured patterns and pictures. And very sorry, life isn't like that. And more generally, I would say, if you're not scared shitless by the way the world is going at the moment, you need to wake up fast. Yeah, I, I did like um, the tips that you had uh, directly following that, like think about smaller units, uh, employ yeah. diversity in your team so that you can cope with those uh, complex situations. Uh, and for example, those two things are things that everyone can employ, in my opinion. Like in, in a company, you can always drill down to a smaller unit and, and find something that the is other practical. Thing is and more than that, look at what I showed you in that landscape picture. We all understand the landscapes. We understand the contour map. We understand what it means. If I click on that and I read somebody's real story and say, how can you tell more stories like that? Everybody understands it. If you look at the literature on cultural change, it is literally full of jargon and esoteric words. What we're saying is look at a map and say, I want more of these and fewer of that. So it's actually really very simple. It's just unfamiliar. I also like the the thought when you said, and correct me if I got that wrong. Um, I what I should be doing is tell people in real life I want more like these and fewer like those. So like pick things that reflect the the way I wanted culture to change um, and. Um, uh, give people examples where you think like this is the direction we we should go and this probably rather not that's in my opinion very good guidance is it something that you would give out as a a rule for people it is, i would or? i would go further than that um you shouldn't be creating your own examples so the maps i showed you are full mm -hmm. of stories from the workforce itself so when you want to say, I want more of these, fewer of those, the material you want more of is stories that people recognize because they came from co-workers. And that's more authentic. Yeah? Yeah. I think that that's a really important point. You need to engage with people's day-to-day -day lives. And you need to stop abstract stories of goodness and truth and the sort of platitudes of the whole movement around values and purpose yeah, where all they do is, is throw together the same fancy words in different combinations, but it means nothing. Um, you had a picture in your talk that said, culture is a tidal wave, you don't stand a chance. Mm. It'll just get you. Yep. And a lot of our customers, and we're, um, you're, you've been kind of skeptical of tools in your, uh, in your um, uh, keynote. So w we, we obviously uh, sell tools, software tools. And um, a lot of our customers say, I don't know how to get adoption for those software systems. Like, I do understand this is good for our organization, but I don't get my people to, to adopt this. And when I saw this, citation that you had is it like futile do, or do they have to wait until the culture changes uh, until this software can get adoption or is there something that they that i can uh, tell them tomorrow that i learned from dave snowden what they can do to increase their software adoption okay. so firstly i'm not opposed to tools i'm currently in my third software startup yeah so I've built three software businesses over the years. So tools are really important. Yeah? But the way they're adopted is also key. So there's a few golden rules here. If you say to somebody, if you use this tool now, it may be difficult, but in a year's time, life will be easier. Nobody will listen to you. You have yeah. to save people times now. So for example, we did some work with the US Army in Afghanistan. We needed to catch company commander observations in the field under fire, and we deployed an app for that. 
But what we said is if you do this, you won't have to write a patrol report tonight. We got 100% compliance. So you have to make people's lives a lot easier if you want adoption. Um, now, there are times when you have to force it, but you need to be very careful when you do that because you can get workarounds. Let me try and this to also links... Sorry, go on. Uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, this is, a, uh, in my opinion, a crucial point in at least my conversations with customers. Um, what you're describing with uh, the U.S. Army is what I would call a top-down approach. So you had um, the authority to say, okay, if you're using this app, you don't have to file any reports anymore, and then you got compliance very uh, directly. But you, you could say that because you had strong backing from the top, as we would say. Is there an adoption pattern that you see that works without that? No, the, the principle is the same, first of all, they could choose to write a patrol report. We just gave them an either or. Okay. Yeah, we didn't we didn't use authority. It was you can choose, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to write a patrol report every night, do it. But we'd like you to do this. I've done the same with a sales force where I've been trying to get improved narrative capture around customer interactions. If you complete your report as you go around on this app, we won't require a weekly sales report anymore. So there's a golden rule on this in knowledge management. If you want half an hour of people, half an hour of people's time now, you have to give them two hours back in the near future. I'll, I'll repeat that. That's if you want I half an hour, yeah, that, that's a very simple rule, right? You also have to do it. So I'll give you another example. One of the first software packages I ever built was stock forecasting and inventory management. I started off in the sticks. And we'd done some very exciting stuff, which basically dynamically adjusted buffer stocks so we could radically reduce spare parts mm -hmm. yeah, um, or spare stocking. So one of our clients was Coca-Cola. So we would do, and they were handling with Coke in depots going out to shops. Now, we could prove that our algorithms were better than any of their managers. But their managers still overrode the algorithm. And then we actually found when we stopped that, that they were keeping private warehouse stock of Coca-Cola. They siphoned off some illegally <laughs> and kept private stock because they would be fired if they were ever out of stock. So we took a different approach to adoption. What we did is we said for the next year, you can override the orders and we will send you a report every day saying whether you got made it better or worse. And your managers will not be allowed to see that. In a year's time, the managers will see it. So we gave them the space to learn before they were subject to scrutiny, and that again got adoption. And this is why one of the things I said to people in the earlier thing is train people in anthropology, because then they'll understand people. Far too few people in systems and systems build have <clears throat> any knowledge about human culture, human dynamics, and human motivation. And the irony is that IT is kind of like fairly structured and ordered. I mean, it's, it's, it's people in IT like structure, they like order. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas actually people outside of IT generally don't. So you've got poor equipment there. You've got to find ways by which people can co-evolve with technology. Yeah, and modify and improve it, which is why I said earlier, small software components interacting around and scaffolding so that you can adapt and adopt and move things around very quickly. That's, that's kind of like where we're going with software architecture. Rapid adoption, yeah, ra rapid adaptation. In fact, that's a good phrase, I haven't thought of it before. If you, want re if you want adoption, make sure you get adaptation, the ability to adapt. So what is the role of a leader when confronting with, or confronted with organizational change? We have a whole leadership track, but what's the role of a leader in this context? Uh, well, I'll tell you what it isn't for a start. The role of the leader is not to create a dynamic vision of the future and have an off-site workshop with consultants <laughs> to write a purpose and a vision statement, right? I mean, it, yeah, it, may keep it, may, it may keep McKinsey's in business, but I don't recommend it. The role of the leader is to listen and to nudge. Uh, one of the things you have to learn if you're a leader is you have to learn to tolerate failure. If you can't live with failure, you shouldn't be in a leadership or management position. You have to learn to listen and see when the landscape is capable of sustaining change. 
right? Now, if you think you have to impose change even though everybody will oppose it, yes, sometimes you have to do that, but the cost is going to be massive. Most of the time, it's observe, listen, and nudge. And again, that's what we do with the landscape. So we give people constant feedback so they can see when the system is ready to change and then a small amount of energy is needed. I'll give you a metaphor on this, all right? If you think about the boiling point of water, there's a thing called the triple point. So the balance of pressure and temperature at a certain combination, something can become water, become solid, liquid or gas, very low energy cost. If you want to get change, you need to get your organization to the triple point where the energy cost of change is actually quite low. Yeah, it's a good, good metaphor. Um, I liked in your talk when you said um, people use an end game strategy on concepts like agile and also um, design thinking when they commoditize it and create certifications and then run on these certifications. Um, What's next? Is extinction the next? Like you had this uh, picture of the wolf, and then it was bred into a um, uh, certain amount of dogs. And you said, yeah, but the resilience of um, those dogs um, is much less than, than of the wolf. So is like after the certifications, when this is like chewed, is that the next thing then agile extinction? Probably if you don't do something different. I mean, there's the Agile 20 celebrations next week. Yeah, no, sorry, next year. Um, I've been arguing, because I'm associated with it, that we should use the metaphor of an Irish wake. So when somebody dies in Ireland, yeah, they have a wake. It lasts three days. Everybody gets drunk. They all say goodbye to the body. They say it at the, way, at the graveside, and then they move on to the next generation. So I think next year should be a wake for our job. Celebrate what it's done and move on. Okay. What's the next concept after Agile? What do you think? Well, I think a lot of the original, that's why I was talking about rewilding Agile. We may even call it Agile, but we need to get back to some of the original ideas about high levels of dynamism and lots of variety in the system. We've been destroying variety. So I think the next generation on this is, first of all, starting to realize that we need to increase the interaction between people and smaller units of software. We've got this manufacturing metaphor by which we're saying, tell us what you want, we'll produce it. And we measure that. Um, actually, what we need to start to do is to produce, is, and I used to say this in Corba Committee back in the 1980s, people are objects too. They have inheritance, they have polymorphism, they have input output. If you create an architecture, which is a mixture of software and people, where you define what the identities are and you define the interactions, then you can create something which will evolve and, evolve and adapt very quickly. And as I say, I think that's the next generation of architecture, is we've got to stop linear processes. And we've also, I think, got to realize that technology is now a tool, right? Now, if I pick up a hammer in my garage, it fits my hand. Yeah, and I know how to use it. I shouldn't have to bio-re-engineer my hand to fit the tool. And what we've been doing in IT for the past three or four day, year, decades is asking people to bio-re-engineer their cognitive processes in order to fit the way we've designed software. And we need to reverse that. Yeah, I, I really loved your uh, citation of, if you want a carpenter to do his best job, let him use his own tools. I, mm. I really love that. Um, Dave, thank you so much for um, being with us. Um, one last question is one of feedback. Um, so your experience specifically, like today, um, how was that difference to other conferences that you talk at? Was it, was it better? Was it worse? Was it the same? What was different? I think there is a vast difference between being physically with people and not being, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, as, I mean, I used to key, keynote a lot, and which was a lot of travel, but it was never tiring because I got feedback from the audience. And we know some of this, if you don't know it, um, scent plays a large part in human sense making at a subconscious level. So we partly determine trust. If you speak a lot at big conferences, you can feel the audience. So you throw ideas out, you see what get works, and you can respond. When you're presenting virtually, you've got no feedback. You're just presenting to a screen or maybe some two-dimensional faces. 
and, and to be honest, those all blur. What you were presenting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I prefer to have a screen of pictures so I can see some sort of faces, all right? Because I need you need some sort of feedback. So somebody who's got a set of slides which they deliver a hundred times, yeah. And you see this. I mean, Jürgen who had Jürgen who had last year, yeah. He he prepares mm -hmm. a series of presentations. They're almost word perfect if you hear them. It doesn't matter where they're presented. Yeah, that's one approach. My approach is more to have a lot of things I could say and see what's working, then modify it very quickly. Yeah, mm, understand. So with the real audience, I've got slides on the iPad and I can choose which ones I use and change the sequence and the order. And losing that is a bloody nightmare. Okay, Martin, yeah. I know I'm, I will be getting a lot of heat for this because we actually have run out of time. But Dave, one question I have, maybe you can just answer it very shortly. Um, I like to listen to talks and when I'm inspired, as I was after yours, I always try to look for books to learn or to get more of their wisdom. I've noticed you didn't publish any books, is that correct? And if so, why? There's a book, <laughs> because I like blogging and also I've been just too busy. There are, I mean, there's a joke in Britain that you, could, you wait for the number 31 bus for five hours and then three come along together. Well, that's what you're going to get with the books. So <laughs> Kinevin 21 um, actually is on Amazon. If you look for the Kinevin book on Amazon, or if you go on our website, if you want a signed copy, you can go on and buy one there and then I'll sign them and post it. So that's, that was produced for the 21st anniversary. I didn't know about it. I got conned into writing 13,000 words for it. And then it arrived one day when I was still in pajamas and everybody with the author were on the Zoom <laughs> screen, right? Um, so that's, that's lots of stories that people have used Kinevin and that's on Amazon now. Yeah, so that's there. The EU handbook on crisis and complexity management, which I've written, which uses Kinevin, yeah, that's going to be available in a few weeks' time, I think. We're waiting to hear on that. Um, but the Director General has written the foreword and I lined up to speak to the President of the Union. So that's coming fa quite fast. Yeah, and then there are two other books. There's a collection of my articles on knowledge management, which is being put together for publication next year. And then there's the Green Book of Kevin, which is Mary Boone, who wrote the Harvard article with me. We're putting that together and that will come out next year as well. Okay. Dave, thank you so much for your thank time you. again. And I'll have okay. something Pleasure. to read now. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, Until next time. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.